be willing to give up control. So I like this idea of a live piece of art, and I just like this idea of making invisible visible through art. Sometimes you can have really serious portraits, but you've got such a great laugh. <laughs> I feel like I want to capture some of the mm. some of the candid nature of your personality. Opera House can and must be many things. It shouldn't cater just to one audience, and it shouldn't be focused on just one corner of the repertoire. It must do everything and be open to the interests of many different people. Inspiring arts and culture. Watch now on iPlayer. What does it take to become a top opera star like tenor Jonas Kaufman? Welsh bass baritone Sabrin Terrell and Greek American soprano Maria Callas. I'm on a mission to find out how opera is trying to attract new audiences and reinvent itself. I think music has the power to change the world. Take me to the opera. Watch on BBC iPlayer. I see myself in, in the girls that we're fighting for. Climate change is real, and we must act now. Argument is less powerful than emotion, and negative emotion is more powerful than positive emotion. More than anything else, when we have more feminist storytellers, things will change. When big names talk, they talk to us. Hello, I'm Christian Fraser, and this is The Context. They have no case. Every single legal scholar that I see, I mean, maybe there's somebody out there, some whack job, but the, uh, for virtually every, everyone, everyone that I've seen, has said there's absolutely no case. It's a case that shouldn't have been brought. The woman who Donald Trump paid $130,000 to to keep quiet has been speaking out in great detail in court. She says that she decided to do that, not because of the money, but she thought it was a win-win. She could get paid and also secure the safety of her family with just getting the story out. Yes, the people call Stormy Daniels, the adult film star who slept with Donald Trump and was paid for her silence. She takes the stand in Manhattan. It has been a salacious day in court. We will get the latest from our correspondent in New York. Israel launches another operation in Rafah. Not the real thing, it says, but the main crossing is closed. We'll hear from the UN's point man in Rafah, who is trying to keep the aid operation afloat. And... A plot to assassinate President Zelensky. Foiled, but what does it tell us about Russia's intent and the enemies within? Very good evening. Stormy Daniels was paid $130,000 for her silence. But that's not what this case is about. It's not the act of paying the adult film star that is under legal scrutiny here. The prosecution allege it is the manner in which she was paid and how it was ultimately covered up. Daniels was paid by Donald Trump just before the 2016 election, the defence say to protect his family. But the prosecution alleged she was paid through his advisor, Michael Cohen, who was later reimbursed for legal services by the Trump organisation. An attempt to falsify business records in that way is typically classified as a misdemeanour in New York, but the prosecution argued that because it was paid right before the 2016 election, that then constituted a campaign finance crime, a felony for which Michael Cohen pleaded guilty in 2018. That is what Stormy Daniels' testimony is central to this case for. What was she paid for? Why was it so urgent? The former president says there's nothing to see. 
Let's speak then to Ned of Torfik, our North America correspondent who is in New York for us. Uh, there have been questions in recent days, Ned, about whether this is actually cutting through. I imagine the evidence we've heard today will be headlines everywhere tonight. Absolutely, Christian. I mean, Stormy Daniels was a hotly anticipated witness, if not the most highly anticipated one. Uh, she, of course, is at the center of all of this, and her account is extremely salacious. So just in terms of the headlines that will come out of this and how it might affect the presidential election is certainly at the top of mind. No doubt Donald Trump's, who focuses intently on how he is portrayed in the media. But look, Look, uh, her testimony really verged on explicit details that even the judge said went too far. She talked about that sexual encounter that Donald Trump denies back in 2006 at Lake Tahoe, uh, testifying that Donald Trump greeted her in silk pajamas, that she swatted him on his butt with a rolled up magazine, and that he posed on the bed before they had sex while she stared at the ceiling. The defense actually called for a mistrial, saying her testimony was unduly prejudicial. But the judge said a mistrial wasn't warranted, though he agreed, Christian, that some of the things were better left unsaid. Did she go into the motivation she had to take the payment? No surprise to the prosecution. Yeah, and I think this is where the testimony really becomes more relevant to the key parts of this case. You know, Stormy Daniels said that she really didn't tell many people about the alleged sexual encounter because she was ashamed. And that in 2011, she did try to sell her story, but she said she was actually threatened by someone in Trump's orbit, who she later came to find out was Michael Cohen, his fixer, uh, saying to essentially leave the story alone and leave Donald Trump alone. That's what she testified. But she says when Donald Trump then uh, began his run for office, she decided that she wanted to get the story out for her safety and, and also to be paid. And she said that was her motivation before ultimately deciding to agree to stay silent in exchange for that $130,000 payment. Yeah, and that really comes to the point that I was just setting out, Neda, is is why she was paid um, and, and the timing of the payment. Did she make the connection between the timing and the election? She absolutely did, Christian. You know, she said that Donald Trump previously had never raised concerns about her keeping quiet about the affair. And as far back as 2011, again, there was no effort to kind of buy her silence. She said, in fact, that she knew it was down to the election because Michael Cohen kept delaying paying her. And she knew if she didn't get paid before the election, she never would. So she is yet another corroborating witness for the prosecution that this was all done to prevent embarrassing information from getting out to influence Donald Trump. Neda Torfi in New York, thank you very much. The intelligence service in Ukraine have uncovered a Russian plot to assassinate President Volodymyr Zelensky. Two colonels from the government's protection unit suspected of passing on secret information to the Russian FSB have been arrested. The BBC has obtained this footage from the Ukrainians, which claims to show the two agents admitting to the plot. It's claimed they bought drones, explosives and mines to Kyiv from other Ukrainian regions to use in an attack. The plan was to follow Mr Zelensky, abduct him and then murder him. They were reportedly recruited before the Russian invasion two years ago. The assassination, according to the statement, was to be timed for President Putin's inauguration, which took place today in Moscow. Here's what the spokesman of Ukraine's security services had to say about it. The network whose activities were overseen by the FSB from abroad included two Ukrainian state security administration colonels who leaked secret information to the Russian Federation. The enemy was actively developing plans to eliminate President Volodymyr Zelensky. One of the most important tasks of the FSB agent network was to find executors among the military close to the president who could take the head of stage hostage and later kill him. Matthew Schmidt is an associate professor of national security and political science at the University of New Haven. Uh, thank you for being with us. Um, 
it sort of puts the focus on the security circle around President Zelensky. How well is he protected? Thanks for having me. Uh, he's obviously very well protected, and we know that it's not just his security service, but it's the CIA, uh, British intelligence, uh, you know, and probably the Poles are out looking uh, out for him too outside of Ukraine. It sparked a conversation in our office today about what would happen if he was killed. Would, would it harden resolve in the West? Would it lead to a collapse in Ukraine? Is there someone with the same charisma as President Zelensky that could take the mantle? Yeah, I think the Russians grossly miscalculate if they think that assassinating Zelensky will, will better their position in the war. Uh, I think it would absolutely embolden Western support. It might be even the kind of event that would draw in uh, Western troops. And it would certainly increase the resolve of the Ukrainian people. Uh, this was a ham-handed plot when you look at it again. So I just, I don't know what the Russians are thinking. Well, that's the interesting point here, isn't it? That we, we sort of have this this fear and respect in some in some in some uh, instances for, for Russian intelligence and what they're capable of. But again, this looks a little bit like the military and, and, and just how inadequate some of it is. Yeah, this is another instance where the West had a perception that the competency of the Russian military was much greater than it turns out it is. And it's the same with their intelligence services, although we've had you know, we've had evidence of this for years. There were the, the plots in the UK. There were the failed plots against uh, Alexei Navalny. So this just continues on in that line. And I thought one of the interesting things here is that this was a hit for hire. This was about money. It wasn't about ideology. And that speaks well of the people around uh, Zelensky, that you don't have people who are, who are doing this for Putin. They're doing it for cash. They do it for anybody. And those people tend to get caught. It was also long distance. I mean, the idea was that they would use a drone and a missile, which again suggests that the FSB aren't that close to President Zelensky. Yeah, they can't seem to find somebody close enough. And remember, these are two colonels in the protective units who still can't get close enough. So they have to come up with this plan to bring in drones and a missile, uh, like you said. And there's, there's lots of points of failure here, right? Obviously, they were caught, but but suppose they hadn't been. There's every reason to believe that those drones or that missile would be shot down by air defense. So this just didn't seem like a very professional operation. D just a final thought. D does it, uh, again, though, put the spotlight on a corruption problem within the Ukrainian military? I think this is a latent corruption problem. You've seen a lot of firings going on in the last year. Uh, to try to root these things out. And remember, these two accused colonels are colonels that came in, uh, you know, uh, early on, I think before 2014. So they've had long careers back when the military was, was frankly, a lot more corrupt. So I'm not sure that it's a present day problem as much as there are some people left in the system who would do things like this for hire. Matthew Schmidt, good to talk to you. Thank you for coming on the programme. Thanks, Christian. Well, we're told the situation in Ukraine was one of the subjects that Xi Jinping raised today in his meetings with the French President Emmanuel Macron. The Chinese leader was on the second day of a state visit to France and was taken this morning to a spa town in the Pyrenean Mountains. In metaphorical terms, that is where soft diplomacy meets unmovable obstacle. There are major concerns here in Europe that the Chinese are dumping their overproduction and that state subsidies are undercutting European industry. Here in Britain, there are fresh concerns about Chinese spying, with new information today that Chinese elements had hacked the payroll of the Ministry of Defence. China said the claims were absurd. Let's bring in uh, someone who's been on the programme before, senior Europe correspondent at the South China Morning Post, Finbar Birmingham. Finbar, good to have you with us. Um, let's start with the, the, the focus uh, on Ukraine. There was some reporting, some rumour today that President Xi has a sort of embryonic plan for a, uh, a peace, a, some peace talks uh, with regards to Ukraine, which is interesting because, as we were discussing last night, it feels as if the Europeans have gone past that point. 
Yes, Christian, I would say you're probably right. I mean, I, I think I saw the same rumours that you did on, on social media. Uh, it hasn't been substantiated, and frankly, I'd be quite surprised uh, looking at the rhetoric that came out of this trip. Uh, they do see as far, seem as far apart as ever. Both sides say they want to bring peace to Ukraine, but they're very different. Uh, they have very different point of views in how they would do that. Uh, Xi Jinping, uh, you know, he reiterated his point in, in, in Paris that uh, the the legitimate legitimate security concerns of all parties in the conflict would have to be respected, and that's anathema both to the Ukrainians and the Europeans who see Russia as the aggressor in this uh, in this war. They don't see the security concerns of the Russians as being legitimate. Um, so, as I don't have any intel on that specific point, it, it seems to jar with the reality of what we've seen in the diplomacy leading up to this. I mean, Chinese diplomats have been travelling to Europe for months now, and they've been been pushing for. For, for example, in order to attend peace talks in, 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 in Switzerland, they, they, they told EU officials that they wanted the West to stop shipping weapons to Ukraine. That's not going to happen. I mean, we, we see an influx of it, an increase in that. So mm. I would I would hasten to, to say that I might be wrong, yeah. but those rumours seem quite far-fetched. But, but that said, what, uh, the, the, President Macron has uh, welcomed today a Chinese commitment, in inverted commas, to abstain from selling weapons to Russia and to closely control the export of dual usage equipment. I mean, <laughs> there's a big difference between a commitment and actually following through on it, but I just wonder if that does reflect a cooling of the relationship between Beijing and Moscow, which has also been discussed. I don't think so. Vladimir Putin's going to China next week. Uh, I don't necessarily see that much of a cooling in the relationship. Uh, Macron did say that he had a commitment from Xi Jinping, but I think he also said that last year when he went to Beijing in, in April. The proof will be in the pudding, uh, particularly on the dual-use goods. The Europeans notice a dramatic increase in the intensity in which China is shipping things like circuit boards and microchips and surveillance uh, equipment and sat satellite imagery. These sorts of dual-use items that they say are rocking up on the battlefield in Ukraine and, and killing Ukrainians. So uh, the proof will be in the pudding. I mean, one thing we did, did see come out of this, uh, this meeting was that the Chinese supported the French um, push to have a, an Olympic truce, which would be a, a ceasefire in all global conflicts uh, during the Paris Games in July and August, which sounds great, of course, but again, I don't think the Russians or, I mean, many parties at, at conflict would pay heed to the timing of the Olympics in, in terms of when they're going to have a ceasefire. Trade was a big part of the discussion today. Um... We know that the Commission, the European Commission, is wrapping up its uh, anti-subsidy investigation into Chinese electric cars. But what the Chinese are very good at is divide and rule. Um, I don't think the Germans are particularly keen on this investigation because, of course, they have a very close relationship with the Chinese when it comes to cars. Not so the French. It's true. Uh, the Germans and the, the French are quite far away, on far apart on how they see this. Uh, the French were actually, they were the ones who sponsored the Commission's uh, investigation on an, on an unofficial basis. Uh, what we saw this week was the, the French double game in, in, in motion. They want to see subsidy, anti-subsidy duties put on the import of Chinese cars coming to Europe, but they also want the Chinese to build, to set up uh, electric vehicle factories in France. Uh, th this is quite clear. They said this on the record. This is what they want. Uh, the Germans don't like any of this. Uh, so, so, so we do see um, that the Europe's two major powers are, are sort of pulling in, in opposite directions, whereas the French really love the tougher trade uh, stance that Brussels has taken. They, the French diplomats here in Brussels, they joke that, that Brussels itself is becoming more French, whereas it's an anathema to the Germans who, as you say, are far more exposed to the Chinese economy. There's a couple of other stories I want to touch on uh, outside of France today. Of course, um, the story here in the UK that uh, China is thought to be behind a hack uh, of the UK uh, Ministry of Defence's payroll, uh, which is embarrassing for the MOD, but of great concern, not just to the UK. There are other European governments who have uh, these concerns as well. 
Yeah, it's part of a trend, I would say. I mean, in the last month, we've seen a real ratcheting up in these cases of alleged espionage on the part of the Chinese intelligence services. Just this morning in Brussels, in fact, uh, the, the, the far right, the German far right, the AFD's uh, lead candidate in the European elections, he's an MP called Maximilian Kra. His office in the European Parliament was raided uh, by German and Belgian police investigating his assistant for spying for China. We saw four German nationals, including uh, Kra, assistant arrested last month uh, for, for, for the same uh, charges and of course you recall that there I'm sure you've covered on the show the MPs in the UK mm. who've had their phones hacked by China we saw the head of the Belgian Foreign Affairs Committee have the same uh, the same problem the former Belgian Prime Minister Guy Verhofstadt mm. says his phone was hacked by by Chinese uh, intelligence services so there's a big uptick in this. I don't know what the Western authorities are going to do about it because it seems to be a bit of a problem. Yeah, uh, and they're being repeatedly exposed by it. Uh, one last thought. Uh, TikTok, uh, as we expected, have announced that they are going to uh, challenge a US law that could force a nationwide ban on the app. Not entirely surprising. They said they would sue, and presumably with the backing of the Chinese state. Well... The backing of the Chinese state, I don't know if that would help them very much. I mean, it's often quite humorous to me to see, uh, for instance, um, you know, Chinese diplomats and Chinese state journalists going on Twitter to really voice support for TikTok, TikTok when the company itself is trying to convince everybody that it's got no connections to the to the Chinese state. Um, you know, it's no surprise that they're going to challenge this. As you said, in Europe, actually, we had a, a story last week where President von der Leyen of the Commission said that she didn't rule out banning TikTok here. I think that's a long, long way away. Um, but yeah, I mean, it seems to be on to a bit of a hiding to nothing in, in the United States, like many Chinese companies are. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a tough environment for them. Finn by Birmingham, always good to talk to you. Thank you for coming on. Thanks, Christian. Around the world and here in the UK, this is BBC News. For our UK viewers who are still with us, let's have a look at some of the headlines here today. John Swinney uh, will become Scotland's seventh first minister after being nominated by Parliament. The SNP leader succeeds Hamza Yousaf, who resigned from office earlier today. His appointment will be rubber stamped by the King before he is officially sworn in at the Court of Session on Wednesday. There have been no trains on some of the busiest commuter routes in the country today due to strikes by Aslef train drivers. Disruption is expected to continue throughout the week. Tomorrow, it's a different set of operators which will be affected, among them Avanti West Coast and Great Western. And it's been revealed that Prince Harry will not meet the King during his visit to the UK this week. A spokesman for the Duke of Sussex said a meeting between father and son wasn't possible because of the King's busy schedule. Harry is in London to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the Invictus Games, which he set up, of course, to rehabilitate wounded or sick service personnel. You're watching BBC News. The White House said this afternoon it is still hopeful Israel and Hamas can close the remaining gaps on a ceasefire agreement the Palestinians have accepted, but Israel has rejected. So why did the Israelis appear blindsided by a negotiation the CIA director Bill Burns was so involved in? Sources say Bill Burns has returned to Cairo for talks today. Those close to the talks say the US invited the Israelis to Cairo over the weekend, but they had declined to send a team. One Israeli official told Axios this morning that was a mistake that led to Israel having less visibility on the final stages of the talks. Well, they have begun again today in Cairo and the Israelis have now sent a mid-level delegation. Hamas, which is a prescribed terrorist organisation by the UK and other Western governments, say the ball is now in Israel's court. We emphasise that the ball is now in Netanyahu and the extremist pillars of his government's court. Their behaviour after Hamas's approval is an indication that he is insisting on disrupting the efforts of mediators, including the US administration. And also, he doesn't care about the lives of his hostages, who face death every day. Without an agreement, the fighting continues and things are escalating inside Rafa. The Americans say they've been assured this is a limited operation designed to cut Hamas's ability to rearm. But the Israelis have cut off the main crossing point in Rafa, which severely limits the aid operation. Before we came on air, I spoke to Sam Rose, UNRWA's director of planning. He is in Rafa and trying to keep the operation going. A couple of days ago, we woke up to the news that Israel had enforced 
evacuate an evacuation order for a kind of a, a three mile area or so in the eastern side of of Rafa. They estimate that about a hundred thousand people live in that area, and the evacuation order. Uh, told people that they had to move, so it's tantamount to, to forced displacement, which is illegal under international law. And it's a similar pattern to what we've seen in other parts of Gaza, starting in Gaza City on, I believe, the, the 13th of, of October. So two days ago, that evacuation order was, was issued. We heard almost, I guess it was almost this time last night, about 24 hours ago, that uh, Hamas had announced it and accepted the, uh, the ceasefire agreement. So there was a sense of relief and a sense of respite. The, and there were even celebrations in, in the street. I mean, they turned out to be premature because the news following that was that the uh, the, the deal had been rejected by, by Israel. And we woke up this morning to the sound of heavy bombardments. A lot of people from within inside that evacuation or area have have left, but a lot of people outside that area have left as well. I mean, Rafa is home to about 1.5 million people. Five out of six of those people are, are displaced. So most people here are living in tents, and some of those people living in tents outside the evacuation area or the area that was subject to an evacuation order have just decided to move now. So a lot of movement on the streets, a lot of fear quite a lot of panic and, and severe anxiety amongst an already exhausted population. I've worked in Rafa, so I do know that either side of uh, the crossing, which has now been closed, is this sort of corridor which tanks can move up and down. Is that, is that the situation now, that, that effectively the Israelis have control close to the wall, close to the Egyptian border, such that, what, that aid can't get in at all now? Yeah, I mean, since October and, and for many years, actually, the only entry point for aid and commercial supplies to Gaza has been in Rafa, uh, the Kerem Shalom border crossing, which will, you'll know is in the southeastern corner of uh, Rafa. That closed on Sunday following a, a Palestinian attack on an Israeli uh, military point. But yeah, I mean, uh, we woke up this morning to the news that Israel had taken control of the Palestinian side of the crossing. You may have seen the, the video clips, the video footage taken by IDF soldiers fairly gratuitously mowing, uh, you know, driving tanks over lawns and, and, and vandalizing the, the, the crossing point. But more fundamentally from uh, a kind of humanitarian perspective, it, it, it means that that crossing point is closed. We are going to speak tonight to someone from the Israeli Knesset, uh, and I know from a, a briefing conversation with her that she's concerned UNRWA is part of the problem in Gaza. It's a criticism we've heard before from the Israeli government. I wonder what you make of that officially. I mean, we've heard this a lot. UNRWA is not part of the, the problem. UNRWA is the largest aid entity operation on, on the ground in Gaza. We're the ones who are essentially keeping people alive. We're providing flour, we're providing food to almost 1.9 million people, 85, 90% of the population. We're providing 25,000 healthcare consultations for, for, you know, for, for people, refugees and non-refugees inside Gaza. Historically, Palestinian refugees have enjoyed some of the highest rates of literacy, the best health outcomes in this part of the region. UNRWA is absolutely not part of the problem. UNRWA is what's keeping Gaza going, sadly, right now. And we have a collective responsibility, and Israel has a responsibility as per the findings of the, uh, the International Court of Justice. Sam Rose there from UNRWA. And as I say, we will speak to a member of the Israeli Knesset tonight to get some answers on that ceasefire and why it's currently stalled and how long this operation in Rafa will last. Do stay with us. Hello there. Despite some cloud across northern areas, especially across Scotland, much of the country had a pretty decent day today with a good deal of sunshine around. It felt quite warm through the afternoon. That's how we're keeping things for the rest of this week. Always a bit more cloud across this northwest corner with some rain at times, particularly the north and west of Scotland. By far the bulk of the dry, sunny weather will be across England and Wales. There may be the odd isolated shower here and there. 
but uh, most places will stay dry. In fact, a pretty good looking week coming up all in all. Thanks to high pressure, which has been building in, killing off the showers, pushing away the weather fronts. It's left a legacy of cloud, though, and that's what we're going to see again across parts of the north of the UK and also some sea fog, some mist and murk here and there across the North Sea coast and towards the Irish Sea as well. But generally dry for most with a few clear spells, uh, temperatures 6 to 10 Celsius. High pressure then dominates the scene, gets a bit stronger across the country. So I think we'll see fewer showers for England and Wales. But these weather fronts will bring thicker cloud, more of a breeze, outbreaks of rain to the northwest of the country. Most places starting dry, a bit of mist and murk to start off with. Plenty of sunshine, England and Wales, southern and eastern Scotland, Northern Ireland. Then we'll start to see splashes of rain with increasing breeze across the north and west of Scotland into the afternoon. So 13, 14 degrees here, up to 20 for southern Scotland, 21 or 22 in the warmest spots in England and Wales. The wind's generally light coming in from the south. Wednesday night, most places dry again with clear spells, variable cloud. Stays quite uh, cloudy, breezy, with outbreaks of rain across the northern half of Scotland through the night. And temperatures again, 6 to around 10 degrees. So for Thursday then, I think we'll see more sunshine around across England and Wales. Bit of a cloudy start, then the sunshine really gets going. And I don't think there'll be any issues with the showers whatsoever. Should stay completely dry. Bit more cloud for northern Scotland. The odd shower here, but southern Scotland, Northern Ireland doing pretty well. Temperatures 19 or 20 degrees here. 22 or 23, the warmest spots across England and Wales. High pressure continues to bring fine weather on Friday uh, and into the weekend as well. But it starts to retreat towards the continent and allows low pressure to take over initially from the west as we head through the latter part of Sunday. So it could be quite warm Friday and certainly into the weekend across the south of the country. By the end of Sunday, we start to see a few showers, I think, pushing into western areas. Take care. Some of the UK's biggest crime stories. Brianna wanted to be famous in a really sad way. There she is now. Something's happened. I say, where's my brother? There's just silence. As told by those who investigated them. If you've got anything on that's going to hurt me or you. I've seen the footage. It always gets me here. And the effect on their loved ones. He was taken before his time. He didn't deserve to go like this. The Big Cases. Watch on BBC iPlayer. Now it's a defensive position and can only be activated if the militia attack. They are proud of their democracy, but they also fear it's now under threat from China like never before. Every time the government drops tear gas, people disperse, but the farmers come back. When you're this close to the river, which is a front line, you are always watched, so you have to move quickly. There when the story breaks. BBC News. Follow on the app. The world of film is changing faster and faster all the time. Our global Talking Movies team brings you up to date on the latest in movie making from around the world. Stories from other cultures. Interviewing top filmmakers and stars. They didn't think I'd ever seen anything like that on screen. From blockbusters to art house cinema, we'll spotlight the brilliant and unique voices bringing their stories to the big screen. Talking Movies. Watch on BBC iPlayer. You're watching The Context. Now it's time for Europe Votes 2024. Welcome to the programme. We are now just a month away. From June 6th to June 9th, millions of people will be voting to elect the next European Parliament. 720 politicians from 27 countries in what many consider to be a pivotal moment for the future of the European Union. And if you've been following this series, then you will know that for several weeks now we've been moving from country to country as we try to get a better idea of what people will be voting on. We've been to the Netherlands, to Spain, to France. And tonight we are in Italy, the EU's third biggest economy and the European frontier when it comes to migration across the Mediterranean. In 2023, 157,000 refugees and migrants reached Italy via sea, marking the fourth consecutive year of increasing arrivals, a 50% rise on the previous year and the third highest year for sea arrivals since 1998. 
The right-wing government of Giorgia Maloney was elected to deal with this problem. She's been leading the reform of asylum rules in Brussels and more recently has signed a deal with a third country, Albania, to build two new detention centres where they will process Italy's backlog. Now, not so long ago, Maloney's post-fascist government would have been snubbed in Europe, perhaps seen as an outlier. But there's been a drastic realignment. And in every country we have thus far visited, it is the hard right that lead the polls. There are other systemic issues. Its public finances are still in a precarious condition and Italy needs more workers for its various industries. But as Mark Lowen has been discovering, that drive to grow the workforce could be held back because of the growing hard-right influence. The big beasts of Italian politics are lining up for their European battle. And at Circe Farm, south of Rome, which rears 1,800 buffaloes, the question is whether change is afloat. It's a very Italian family business, churning out exceptional mozzarella and ricotta. The grandson of the founder says the problems are many, from European farmers being undercut by non-EU countries to another long-standing Italian issue. It's not that easy to find workers. Medium salary in Italy is not growing up from a long time. And this is very sad because many times...